Hi everybody, um, I'm Kate Fogger, this is Julie Hurt, and again, I read somewhere that you shouldn't say that. I'll have to get that in context because I can't imagine what you're supposed to say instead. Um, but we are making light to humans being, to humans, to human beings, to humans being. We're being human and there's two of us. So we're two the humans. The two humans being. being. It's very clever, isn't it? Yes, it's so far. We thought of that then. <laughs> okay. I know so, you did that too. <laughs> <laughs> so um, last week, uh, before the session that we recorded, um, I was having uh, yet another, I don't even really know what the word existential crisis is, but I suspect that's what it was. I go through these phases of, oh my God, it's all shit. I don't know what I'm doing. What have I done? Um, I'm rubbish at this. I'll never get any better. I'll never make any more. All of that. Um, and Judy very kindly talked me through it. And we, we were specifically talking ab about money um, in the context of within a relationship, because it was, um, I can't remember exactly, I'm sure I'll remember as I start talking, but it was about how Gary and I handle money and um, stuff like that. So I could see as I was watching it, like I start fidgeting and there's a lot of this. And there's a lot of this, and there's a lot of this, and a lot, and I could see me getting like more of them because we have to record it just because oh, well, we, we do in case we get gems out of it. Um, so Julia had said at the end of the session, she, she'd give me a session with the guys, and she said at the end of the session, um, I want you to watch this again, Kate. And I did the clearing as well, as you said, I did the clearing. So what you had said, and I don't understand all of it, which is partly what I want to talk to you about, but I, I got enough of it to know that you were really, really triggering me. I was just like, make it stop. Right? Um, oh, it was, it was fascinating to watch, really uncomfortable, brought back all the same emotions. And I'm still trying to unpick them. So I want a bit of insight on that. But also what has happened since then, I'll explain to you. So I think what we were talking about is I had said, um, I'm gonna have to put some long gaps in here that I can take out. I had been explaining that since I had given up my work and um, that actually I had been subsidizing income to the household. So Gary and I met after I had been, I had been married before, um, I lost a lot of money, but my first husband um, was a student, I think, at the time that I we separated, and I gave him half my pension because I was one with big fat wage at the time. Big fat wage on that big, but you know, it was pretty good for my 30s. I was earning more money than I ever thought was possible. Um, I at the time, my pension was great for what it was at the time. It was in the heady days of people thinking that putting money aside was going to make you live in luxury. So it probably was a good pension in those days. And I had company shares and all of that stuff. And I gave him half of, of that. And I had to find that money to give him, obviously, because I couldn't take it out of my pension. I did it because he was a good man. And because we hadn't really fallen out, we had separated, we had, whatever you like to say, but there was no it was painful and everything, but there was no wrongdoing or anything like that. And 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 he had supported me as a student, um, not in the lap of luxury, and I was not without my own funds, but, you know, fair's fair and all that. Because uh, I am quite fair like that, I think. However, when we moved in, when I moved in with Gary, Gary had never lived with him. So this is Gary too. Um, he had never lived with anyone before. He had never even shared a flat with anybody before. Um, he had never been married before, he'd never lived with a partner or anything like that. And I, of course, had my flat in Edinburgh, which, um, and he had a flat in Falkirk, but that, you know, they're just like, it's like, no offense to Falkirk. Well, yes, offense to Falkirk, Tim Pot, big city, you know, so I had a lot of capital in my property. So, when Gary sold his flat in Falkirk, I mean, he puts on the proceeds into the house and that, but I mean, again, and I sort of kept tabs on, and I, I, I have issue with saying this because you immediately <laughs> reacted to that with the guy who kept tabs on. But yes, I kept tabs on how much capital I had in the property because we're talking about the difference between a £250,000 property and a £40,000 property, that's what I'm saying. And it was along the lines of, I'm quite happy that we share everything, we moved to a new property together and everything, but I came with this. Is essentially it um and we put money into a joint account and all our joint expenses go out to that joint account and everything else is separate and it has always been that way and here we are suddenly 20 years 19 20 years later 
And it's just still like that. But I have continued to put money in the property because I had shares. So I worked for a company when I left the company and I got rid of my shares and stuff like that. I would put that money in. I had some money that I had inherited from my mom. Not, not inherited, obviously, because she's not there, but I had some money in trust that I put into this house in order to build the shed, in order to make a business so that I could stop working, et cetera, et cetera. So I've put large sums of money into the property, which I have also kept a record of. We don't really look at it. It's just when we've moved house and moved forward, I have sort of kept a rough well, along the lines of, well, I own 25% of the capital in this house. Just along as it's that vague, I am quite happy to have my sums open to scrutiny in the event. And I've always said to Gary, albeit a bit tongue in cheek, you know, if we ever separate, just so you know, this is what I think is mine. And this is, your, you know, just like that. But of course, as the houses got, got bigger, the, the uh, potential for it earning of the capital has grown bigger proportionally with every bigger property we've got. So if I own 25% stake, that 25% stake obviously is getting bigger as the value of the property goes up. Um, and also then I've now put in a very large sum um, of my shares and other, anyway. So I sort of broached the subject with Gary because part of my grievance has been if I didn't want to do the shed and if we wanted to move, this is very long winded, is it really? So if we wanted to move, what you're yes. about to tell me since we talked last week, you broached the subject again with Gary since we yes. talked last week. Okay. Yes. Okay. So what we talked about, you said that I had that I was on this island around money, which I, I sort of get and I don't really. Um, I mean I get that about I think what you were telling me was aside from my relationship with Gary I have an issue with money and that was quite an eye-opener mm -hmm. and it made me realize that because you said I have an attachment to money mm -hmm. and I was sort of like you know but I realized as I was watching it and I was seeing it that in all my relationships all my relationships I have always been better off than my partner in terms of I have either arrived at the relationship with something like a house and with my first husband, I had a good wage and I had a first class honours degree and he was a barman, you know, that sort of thing. It has never been something that had bothered me, but I've always known that I would be all right on my own. Do you know what I mean? Like I have never needed somebody financially and that I realised as we were talking and as I rewatched it has oh. actually been really important to me. You know, so I am all altruistic about not caring how much money somebody puts into the pot, but inside there is a little clock ticking about, you know, that I'm I'm I need to know I'm going to be okay on my own. If this goes tits up, I'm not. I don't mind being out of pocket. I think I'm quite a fair person, but I I'm not going to be screwed, basically. Um, so I haven't explored that side of it as much because, but it was a realization that actually. Um, there's a huge element in feeling safe. I, I I rely on money to make me feel safe. And I don't think that's unusual, but it's a bit of an eye opener to me because I don't think of myself as materialistic. I don't think I am materialistic, particularly any more so than anyone else. Mm -hmm. But I do get comfort out of knowing that, that I financially I, I could manage if I had to on my own. I don't actually need anybody else. So that was a bit of a thing. But what I got touchy about, I don't know if you remember, was you'd sort of mentioned this keeping tabs on. And I immediately went into defensive mode because to be honest, when I approached Gary with this, I'm about to run out of money. Um, I, you know, part of me feels this is in the past now, a few weeks now, but I went through this process of if we sell this house and get a small house, it can actually release enough capital that I don't have to, I, I, it will tide me over until I can properly retire because I can't retire at the moment because A, I'm not old enough, and B, I don't have enough money. And, um, you know, it was like, but, and then there's this resentment that I feel like I'm trapped here because all my money is in the house. Gary, on the other hand, isn't going on holiday because of COVID and he's putting money into savings. It's like, well, that doesn't feel right to me that I have to take money out of savings in order to live whilst he's putting money aside. That was, that was my premise. Anyway, as you pointed out, I didn't bring it up in a, uh, as with all these things, I overthink it. I get myself in a state and I blurt it out with it in all the wrong timing. He gets, uh, didn't realise you were still keeping tabs on all of that, you, you know, because I always go, well, it doesn't matter for as long as we're together, but I, just so you know, I own 76% of this house, mate, which he was, uh, and I could feel his hurt. 
So on the one hand, I'm like, well, you know, okay, we've been married nearly 20 years. Maybe I should rethink this. I had then gone into guilt mode about, well, it, it's stupid that I'm keeping tabs on all of this. So I don't know if I'm explaining this very well, but you, when you had sort of said about me being attached to the money and keeping tabs on it, I had immediately gone to, you think it's wrong that I am, um, yeah. Oh. Well, you, the guides, yeah. but the guidance yeah. is that I am being judged on the fact oh. that I haven't offered my husband 100% of everything I own. That's where I went. And that's where the hostility and the defensiveness comes in because it's like, well, just a hang on, just a fucking minute. It's my hat, you know, and it does because I know in an ideal world, I'll go, no, take everything because I can I can always generate more because I am a money magnet. But, you know, then there's that the ego comes and goes now just a minute. It's all very well you being all altruistic like that, but there's no reason. And no, there's also no spiritual reason. You're not supposed to help other people out. You know, you're not supposed to, you don't have to give money away just because it's the right thing to do. You give money away because you are free to give it. Not, you know, there's no right or wrong in it. And you don't, so this is what all this is coming to. But I, I got really about that because that, I felt like I was being judged because I still have written on a piece of paper the fact that I own 86 or 76% of the house. And felt really guilty about that. That um, is it wrong to have spent this much time living with someone where clearly we're, you know, we must in some way be compatible. We're still here 20 years later. That maybe, maybe I should wipe the slate clean with him. To clarify, was that what the guides meant? Wait, what was the two? Wait, what was the? <laughs> what? Okay. Did, so, the guide, did the guides were the guides judging you on? Yes. Yeah. Well, I know they're not. I know they're not judging me, but I realized my defensiveness was about because you you picked up on the keeping tabs on, the which you up on keeping tabs, yes, yes, uh -huh. and they kept they, they really picked up on was when you described how you asked Gary the question about money. He said you're still keeping tabs. That's how you said he said it. And the guides picked up on keeping tabs and that you were keeping tabs. So there's no, and just now as you were talking and all of that and you brought up keeping tabs and then you said judgment, the guides were like keeping tabs equals workaround is what I saw. Like I saw an actual equation. Yeah, again, keeping tabs. It equals keeping tabs equals workaround. So what they're saying is the practice of it's the holding on to, isn't it? Is a workaround. Yes. So keeping yes. tabs is a signal that that's that is actually a workaround. It's a signal that there's attachment. It's all of the yes. to unravel that whole ball of string. So to be clear, it's nothing to do with whether or not I should give the house to Gary. It is entirely about the fact that I am keeping track of money like this. Right. So I had oh, gone to judgment. Oh, 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 let me just ask: Is it that you are keeping? Yes, they just want to make sure they're very clear that if you want to keep track of money, that's fine. What they're asking is that you recognize that you that you use it as an opportunity to recognize the emotional aspect. So like if you're keeping tabs and it's a it's like a loose ball of string with the emotions around the keeping tabs, like why? And I hear motivation of why you're keeping tabs, like and I feel, I feel like safe. Yeah. Yes. And I'm getting like all food bunched up this way, but it's almost like you put a whole amount of shellac and like glue and everything. So this tightness just becomes so tight. It actually, actually it hurts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and again, I feel defensive, but what's odd, I feel defensive on two counts, but the thing that's really triggering me and I realize that there are two things triggering me, but what was triggering me when we spoke about this before is I was reading that as judgment as to how can you be married to somebody for 19 years and still care who owns what in the house and actually that's not what they were saying at all it's irrelevant and that was a big realization for me which i will come to yeah. so but so let's go back so i understand that it's the keeping tabs on in the sense that i mean i can feel it in my emotion like less so today about <laughs> 
but it's mine, but it's mine, it's mine, and nobody can take it away from me. And it is, and it's this whole thing that I have realized that I have always known that I would be okay on my, I could walk away if I wanted to. So I can be all blasé about not needing anyone in my life, but it's only because I've got this big fucking safety blanket in my head that financially I would be okay. Yeah. Which is um, huge. Like I just hadn't realized, like I've, I've never been rich. I've been okay. The, the latterly in my career did quite well, thanks very much. Um, but again, I haven't really spent money or went in a fucking house, which is why I'm so possessive over it. But, you know, I've never had a lot of money and we never had a lot of money growing up, but we were all right. And I hadn't realised that I had this attachment because I'm, I don't spend, well, obviously, you see how I dress. Like, I don't spend money on stuff at all, really. I mean, I do, but not clothes. I don't care about cars. I don't care about those sort of things. We used to go on nice holidays. That's all we did. But anyway, all of, all of. So... What is interesting, and this is what is this whole judgment thing about what is um, whose is what in a marriage and stuff like that made me realize I actually thought I couldn't. I tried to get into a better state of mind about it, but actually I was in a like, I really need to talk to my guy about this because now this is really upsetting me because I feel like, you know, I'm not sharing my lot with him and all that. So I had a conversation with him. Where I tried to be calm and I said, look, I realized that when I said this about how much money is mine, I felt hurt off you. And he was like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> and he looked a bit like taken aback, like this is a trap, what do I do? And I said, <laughs> I just want you to know that you know, the reason that I had said that is, you know, if we we are either at a stage in a relationship where we go, right, what's mine is mine, what's mine is yours, what's mine is mine, what's yours is mine is Gary's face. But we're either at a stage where we share everything or we talk this out so that I don't now feel bad that I'm keeping curbs on how much I own in the house. Um, and do you know what his response was when I asked him? If he was prepared to support, you know, we had this conversation about whether he'd be prepared to support me. He looked really uncomfortable and shifted around a bit. And I was like, just fucking just be honest. And he wouldn't say it until I said, I completely understand if you feel that there's no reason for you to support me, you know, that you're doing a job you hate. And why should you support me when technically there's no reason I'm not ill. Like, let, let's let's be clear here. It's I'm not not working because I can't work. I like to think it would have been a different conversation, but essentially I am choosing not to work. I personally feel I couldn't now, but there's no medical reason to work. And, you know, so I sort of said, is it, you know, is that what it was? So he, he said, yeah. He said, because essentially I'm doing a job I hate and you get to give yours up. And you promised me when you gave up your job that it would not financially impact me, which is true. And I did. And I have been paying it out of saving. My concern at the time then was not so much about me living off less, was the fact that I would not be able to go on holidays and stuff like that. And there, he would have this expectation. And I'd be like, you need to understand, I will pay for myself, but there'll be no five star holidays for me because I'm not going to have any money. You know, that sort of thing. Now, so all this sounds really, when I say it out loud, sounds really um, clinical and that, but actually, that was our marriage agreement. And this is what occurred to me. These two things are completely separate. Loving somebody and a marriage agreement are two completely separate things. We just assume that if you love somebody, they should financially support you, take care of you and all of that. That's not actually part of the agreement. Discuss. Interesting. Because, because what Gary said on the back of this, I was like, well, you know, we can carry on the way we are, obviously until such time that I run out of money. But, you know, I said, but I don't want to feel bad about the fact that I own X percent of the house. You know, we either have this relationship where you just put money in a pot, which is what other couples do. And whoever puts more, you know, and you share everything or we continue this model. It's like you can't have it both ways. You were either in with me and supporting me and then the, half the house is yours or we continue the model that we have had ever since we got married, which is we cover the joint expenses together and everything else is separate. He wants to keep it separate because he says that in his view, everybody he knows, one of the biggest things they fight about is money and how to spend money and everything like that. And he says he thinks it's a really 
really good idea and that all his friends think that our model is fucking marvelous <laughs> because he gets to spend his money as he chooses there's no and this is true there's no discussion about how he chooses to spend his money and i've always actually been really quite relaxed about stuff as long as there's enough i know if there wasn't enough then do you know what I mean? It's like, so there was me feeling like I had shortchanged him and, and horrible. And he's like, I don't want to change the system. This system was working for me. Again, another huge assumption that I'm sort of doing him out of something when actually he's going, I don't want to support you. Actually, you've got enough money. Sell the fucking house for you. <laughs> you know, but the point is, he doesn't want to change the system. So our agreement over money is completely separate you know, it, from love, does that make sense? Because there is an expectation and a contract when you get married. Now, if I was sick and unable to work or didn't have money, this would be a different conversation. And I can't pretend to understand or know what that would be. I'm just being clear here. Nobody's run out of money here. Nobody's on the breadline. No one's being done out of anything. This is actually just an academic spreadsheet exercise that Gary had between us, you know, about who owns what, because technically, you know, Thoughts, Julie. <laughs> so the guys have been rather chatty <laughs> as you were oh, no. talking. Here's what they're and talking. I'm gonna get triggered all over again, am I? And talking. Yes, and talking. So here's so the guys were just so they they were just they were pulling as I was listening to you, they were pulling little threads. So at one point I was just like, okay, wait, I don't know where to go. I don't, where do you want me to go? Because at one point I could have picked up a thread, right? I, Julie, could have picked up a thread that they pulled. So I sat and just said, okay, so shape this. How, how where do you want us to go? So this is, so they're like, first let her get it all out of her system. So that's why you talked. They want to show you in a loving supportive way as if you were looking at a mirror when you go back to watch this how long you talked and justified everything mm -hmm. okay so they want they're also saying there is the marriage love and they're bringing me back to love or fear only two things Love's the only thing that's real, right? And then you can make a decision and love a fear, right? So they're, they're putting that there and they're, they're leaving it right there, just there. Then you have the contract that you talk about, which is they show me the contract and they show me Kate's brain. So they're showing like you have, and they're not judging. They're wanting me to say they are not judging how you and Gary have decided to navigate life together. They are saying this thing around money for both of you, there is a soul contract in here because he's got a shit ton of emotions. This is what they say. Shit ton of emotions tied up in money, as do you. And they're bumping up against each other as they were meant to do. So there is a really cool, and this is what I hear them say, really cool opportunity to do the really deep dive work together using money as the conversation okay so now now i'm like yeah i don't want to go there yeah. i don't want to go there with him okay he well, doesn't want to okay. go there okay well see this is why this is all these all these little triggers are all the opportunities to take the step back oh, the really deep oh I, I understand that but believe me i've got enough shit to work on myself without dragging gary into that maybe that'll be next year's project no and if you're still working through money and i do there okay they're just saying opportunity and they're saying slow contract. He's got money shit. You've got money shit together. You have money shit. There's money shit. <laughs> so they're, but they're putting that there. They're bringing me back to one of the very first things they shared with me as you began to talk in that money signifies to you independence. Mm -hmm. Without money, this is how your brain, this is what they're showing me in your brain, this equation, no money equals no freedom. No money equals insecurity. Mm -hmm. 
no money means no money means and it looks like you kind of slant and have to lean on someone and that right there mm -hmm. is not happy that doesn't feel good that no. is scary as shit that that has that i can't even find the words that is my core yeah i see absolutely that the root of this is a belief that i could never ever rely on anybody ever there is nobody to rely on that's quite sad but yes but and that's what i'm saying i don't know in a situation where um there was no money or i ran out of money or i was unable to work i don't know what would happen with gary i like to think that it would be a slightly different conversation but i don't know and that to me is unthinkable to be in that situation because i've never relied on anybody for anything ever and therein lies the work is what they're saying because in that so if i i hear the word quagmire but not in a bad way but i see like this round hole and as you look down this hole of what would it take here rely not so much trust there's trust but trust is part of relying is like the larger word of trust be, then trust because it feels like that was just like your first step to begin to rely on someone or feel like you can rely on somebody that's a vulnerability like it i just feel like there's a zipper here on you and it would just like completely unzip all of this to uh, to allow yourself to rely on someone for a little bit and just feel what that feels like that's a huge step what they're saying is when that begins to happen other things will come up Try, like other things will come up in like an opening up is what they show me so it's like you do this and then there's trust and there's a deepening of relationships there's a new aspect of relationships it's just that this whole thing is a really really big pile to sift but, and, all, I, and i hear you and i agree with every word my ego goes crazy when you say it because as i have just discussed with you i don't gary's not open to that not i, I can't not rely and trust someone who isn't open to it it'd be one thing to have a partner who wants to take care of me i cannot force somebody else to take care of me and I'm not in that situation, so I don't know how to, when you say trust, like how, because I would have to manufacture a situation you, by spending all my money. Right. Yeah. You know, I, it's not, it's not a situation I can simulate, if you know what I mean. Well, when you started talking, you pushed it all on Gary. And they because, said, this isn't about like right now, the first mm -hmm. step, not about Gary, meaning. But how can you lean on someone if there's no one to lean on? You, you can still lean on them, whether or not they stand upright, that's not your problem. You still have to allow yourself to lean. So I understand the principle of what you're saying yeah but in practice what are you talking I, I, it means there's because without yeah. literally giving all my money to the cat's home i cannot replicate i cannot make that situation happen if you know what i mean well see okay so here's uh, i'm asking if they can okay so you understand that the work that has to be done has to be done internally with you right has to be done completely internally with you you letting go of your current view of money 
your approach with money. Like they're just showing me like a really tightly held thing. And they're just like, you have money approach with money. Like each one of these things is another little letting go in an effort to even be able to grab a hold of the zipper. And yes, this is all symbolic. That is your tightness around this whole topic. So you can begin to open up because this becomes vulnerability. This being vulnerable aspect in money is what's really triggering all of this, this holding this tight. So they're slowly trying to open up your fingers to at least be able to grab the zipper to start to open up, feels like your heart, but this whole feeling, okay? Can we go back to the leaning on someone? Yeah. Because if you told me to lean on source, my inner being spirit to support me, I can go with that. I can't go with the leaning on the Gary thing. Because I feel um, I, I can't put him in that position. But you know? don't, you're not, you don't have to pull the money into the leaning part. That's, that's, I think that's, that's what they're saying is tripping you up. There's even just the letting go of just overall, Kate, the human being, Put the money over put the money the money's an illusion anyways it keeps just put it over there it doesn't the money there's more to some degree there's more to it than money but they're going to continue to just stick with money because they don't want to open but it's more like just slightly not financially but just can kate in a situation like i'm asking okay so they're showing me and they're giving me an example so if Brad decides to let Lucas off leash, I used to say, oh my God, no, 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 don't do, don't do that. Everything Brad would say, I would be like, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. And it's, I've stopped, I've not stopped completely, but I see myself, trust him just a little bit more. Oh, okay. And so, so I'm slowly like, you can see every time I trust him just one, with one little stupid thing, like, don't buy those bagels, buy these bagels. Oh, shut up, Julie. He can buy whatever bagels. He's a good, like there's more of that kind of a feeling and just like letting go in situations of anything where you would go, I can't do that to him. I can't do that. I can't, whatever it may be. I, you, there's other, you have a completely different set of, right? But start to see if you can't find opportunities to let go and see if you can't find opportunities to just lean lean in to him lean in to him and just because what well, here's the thing is that they're showing me is when you start to just kind of lean into him it doesn't have to be money things because what's the money conversation is going to be this contentious this is the word they use because of all the emotions you have and all the emotions he have you cannot hear his emotions he cannot hear yours and so it's like you're doing this but at the same time you're also butting heads so until you, Kate, can start to let go of any anything, whether it's money, food, where you're going, the chickens, whatever, and just, okay, I see you. I see that. You do what you need to do. Any, whatever, that's the version they're giving me. These are the small baby steps before you can begin to have this money. Like your money conversation is a while down the road is what I hear him say. And yeah, I mean, I, I'm never going near it again. Well, I have come to a decision yeah. about money, but it doesn't involve him. Say what? I have come to a decision about money, but it doesn't involve him. Oh, okay. I, I can come to that. But in terms of like what you talk about, um, don't have that much interaction if, if I'm honest, but one of the things um, that I do do now and I will do more of, is go out so he has to look after the cat and the chickens and again it's not because he's not capable of it but it, he makes me feel like they're mine and i should be doing it I, it makes me sound makes him sound really it is mean actually yeah, they're my chickens yeah no i had that with um my two dogs previous with brad he would be like they're your dogs not mine they were never my dogs even though he was there when they were acquired 
he always felt that way because I kept it doesn't it doesn't say that about the cat to be fair the cat is ours but the chickens are mine and he loves them but um but the thing is he will do it if he's here and he's perfectly capable of it now here's something I will remind him before I go but that's because he forgets to put them to bed like he won't forget all night but it'll get to like you know, go, oh, fuck, I forgot. Like, and at this time of year, he might well fall asleep before they go to bed. So he doesn't have the opportunity to wake up and go, oh, shit, I forgot about the chickens. Uh, they probably wouldn't die. They'll, they, you know, there is a timer on the coop. Um, but I always check. But that's OK. I'm allowed to remind him. It's just trusting him to take responsibility. And I am doing more of that. I can't think of any other. Op but I will bear that in mind. I know what you mean. I, I think I'm step like you. I think I'm stepping back from telling people how to do things. He does it his own way. It's hard. I'm like, um, some things I won't compromise on, though, like the chickens and the cat. If he doesn't get it right, that's not good enough because this isn't a preference. <laughs> well, there, I can't think of anything. There, there can be an element of him not getting it right because it's not allowed for him to get it right. Again? Okay. There's, there's an element of him not getting it right because he's not allowed to get it right. In that the it's not right has penetrated so deeply in him, he won't, he, and that's his own, that's some degree there's his own work in there, but he, he's not allowed to get, there is no allowing to get it right or to find his own way to write, I guess is a, this is what they're saying is a better way to say it. Because in the moment, it's like, oh my God, you didn't get it right. Oh my God, you didn't get it right. So then they just, there's not even, an, there's not even a willingness or an openness on his part to explore and experiment what is right, if that makes sense. Because we, we like they're showing you and me like we already know what it is we want how we want it we want it this way and not allowing that exploration on their end we are making ask they're they are saying zero to the guys are going like you're at zero to 60 you guys are already at 60. they're over here still at zero going wait what wait well i was watching something and now it's like i gotta and i can't they haven't been able to go down the same path that we've already treaded and figured out what's right they're just like wait what yeah I see more of that in the past than, than in the future, but I agree. Yeah. Um, we just don't do much. There's not much opportunity to do these things because we don't go anywhere. Or, yeah. But I will, um, friends have been talking about going, like, I don't go swimming in the evening because it means having to, and the thing is I cannot. Now that guy's working from home, it's very different. Whereas before he didn't know when he was going to be home. So I couldn't make arrangements because I would not, I don't trust that he can get home in time because you can the traffic's so unpredictable. Yeah. Still. Anyway, but that's besides the point. Yes, I hear you. They but back to the money thing, they do want to have you think about this is what I hear them think about this idea of no money equals and I see you shackled. This whole as far as your independence, like you knew when you had money, eh, I could do whatever I want. I don't care. But the but you have this emotion tied to money equals freedom, which what they're saying is it does in our world. Not necessarily. I no no agreed. But we the, our perception of money is freedom and that's what nick bro talks about is what oh. we want is freedom not money right well see in our perception of money to me it depends on the human because they're saying uh money actually yeah. has bigger shackles I, agreed it. agreed uh, what i what i meant by that is that nick bro talks about it as people think they want money in order to do things and actually what you need to do is focus on what you want to do and not focus on the money in order to do it because if you in the vibration to do it, the money can never hold you back. And that's all that money means in our society is the means by which to do something. But yes, I completely agree that accumulation of money in itself can be as much of a prison. And I get that. Yeah. 
and what I have decided to do, um, whereas before I have been like, well, I sort of want just not just not involve Gary in a conversation. I will just take my money out of savings. And if I run out of money, I run out of money and I'll deal with it. Um, I don't want to sell the house yet. I, I don't really want to anyway. And I'm decided I've been doing, I did the clearing that you suggested about money and then my um, healing codes that I'm doing at the moment are all about releasing my attachment to money. And I do feel different. I'm sort of like, it doesn't matter if I run out of money because there is fear there but it's like um i do have some more savings and it feels to me now more important that i actually get on with the things i want to do just assume that i will live here instead of one foot in one foot out because i do love this house and the only reason we would sell this house is because to downsize to make money that's actually again negative thinking Mm -hmm. you know the whole thing about the think and grow rich is make a decision so make a decision i'm making a decision i want to stay here therefore i'm going to start doing things to this house that will cost money and i will just spend my money in order they're not a lot of money but i just mean like i'd like to get start in a garden i was thinking today about how much pleasure i get out of gardening and i don't do it at the moment because i'm still screwed up about i should be doing this and i should be doing that i should be building my business i should I'm just fucking like let, just do it spend the money because it will require some money and i'm like i can't spend money because i'm not making any and the shed's not it's like fucking spend the money and when you run out of money deal with it then so that's the sort of decision i'd come to does that is that a first step <laughs> um well yeah no <laughs> so I, hear that. <laughs> I don't know how to take it further with gary i can't see the point at this stage in my life saying like right now that's not what they were saying to do right now anyways there's too much emotion i even hear anger um i hear energy there's too much it just looks like two big huge thunderstorms electrical storms that just won't won't even begin to hear each other um there's just there's work for you <coughs> Asking why I'm coughing. There's homework for you more. To some degree, it's like, well, if it's to be, it's to start with me, is what they keep saying. So if you can start to understand all of these attachments around money, there's, it's your, the shift in you will allow him to at least decompress a little bit but it's going to take some time it's going to take some time um this and i'm okay to never discuss it with him again along the lines of um i thought that i had upset him and actually i hadn't he doesn't want to share money so i'm quite happy to continue along my way like that right but you what they're trying to say is you understand that his desire or his saying, I don't want to do anything with money is because of all of the emotional ball that he has around money. Possibly. You know? well, either way, it works for us. And, and uh, you know, it's actually a technical conversation. To push comes to shove and one of us can't work and we really have to reassess it. Up until that point, it's just an academic exercise. You know, we both own the house. We both have money and savings. Do you know what I mean? It's like... Um, it just means I'll be taking money out of my savings. I know, but I guess what they keep coming back is, is like, there's stuff, there's, there's just a lot of uh, work around work and, and awareness work and emotional work around all of this, that for you to even start, every time they've said something about it, it comes right back to money again. I mean, that's how strong this tie is, I mean, is what they're trying to say. There's not the, and then like, you'll say, well, I'm never going to talk to him about it again. And never such a strong word. And it's just like this huge wall. It's like, there's all this, as Danielle would say, like all these juicy bits around all of this, that some of them are metaphors for other areas that you want to work on. Some of them are just about money. But it's, there's so much in this stuff to begin to take a look at and really examine 
to open up for that bigger, better, limitless life is what I hear them say, that um, it, if you immediately shut it down, which is what's been happening, I'm never gonna talk to Gary again, and you keep coming back to money, this immediate shutdown, it's like all of this, this is a huge big opportunity is what they're saying. You can do, of course, whatever you want, do whatever you want. They're just saying that- I don't see the value in, in, I get that we both have workarounds around it, but I can't see the point in me dabbling in his. I got enough of my own shit to deal with. That's no, what that's what I mean by it. Dabble in his right now. That's not even- that's, that's what I mean by it. It's like, I don't want the conversation with him because it's not going to go any way which is helpful for me. I need to deal with my own shit. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess what they're saying is, why do you keep bringing back up Gary? That's not what they've asked you to do at all. Right, okay. Yeah, they're like, stop saying never. You just, because even just that puts a whole block on seeing this whole opportunity that you have. Yeah. So what's my homework? So there's first a recognition of all the ways money pervades. Is that that's the word they say? Pervades? Is that the right, is that a right English word? Pervades mm -hmm. your thinking. Per, is it, okay, so pervade, is that really a word? Pervades your thinking. I think so, yeah. Okay, permeates feels like a better word to me. They're like, they're giving me a thumbs up. Permeates your thinking. So you've got the ego thinking brain. Then they want you to say, think, how does money permeate your emotions? And then how does it permeate your choices on any given day, on any given thing, gardening, no gardening, chickens, no chickens, chicken, chicken food, cat food, anything. Those are the three things. And on the permeates your thoughts and permeates your choices, they want you to note, they actually are asking that you carry a notebook around with you kind of like at all times, or at least take note of it on your phone. Somehow write this down. When you permeate your, what was the first one? Choices is the last Permeates my thinking. Oh, thinking. Thinking. My ego they thinking. They want you to then tap into the emotion. Because there's sometimes when the financial stuff is just right there, emotion, you can feel it. But there's these two things that are carriers for the emotions. So they're trying to get you to really understand what, what the emotions are. But they want, they gave you three avenues because there's, it comes at you different ways. And they just really want you to track those emotions. Track them, and I hear track them all because it feels like a big dirty mess is what I hear them say. And they're not using dirty as a judging word, but it's just like they're showing me like pig pen from Charles Charlie Brown. It's just like all this dirty energy around you, around emotion or around money, around money, and it's the tie you have actually placed. It show they show me like you having a cape. Money is your cape. You've put it around me, and I am super person because I have money. Instead of I am a super person because I'm a super person. So we got to figure out how to take this. Is what I hear them say. Take this attachment to this cape off. This is the first step. There's a lot of stuff. Is what I like. I see them doing this more coming. There will be more coming. This is a longer process because this, like I said, as they said, gets into the one of the big soul contracts you have with him. But you got to start with you and not worry about. Not yet. We would never worry about him anyway. But that part of it is longer term. Yay. Ooh. But that's just it, isn't it? I think um, this is probably far too dull for a, um, uh, an episode. I did a lot of talking. But what's interesting, I suppose with Gary, because it's like, you know, we work through so much shit, and I suppose it's the same with you and Brad, but there are some things I don't even want to go there because I'm not up to it yet. Not yet. Just not up yet. to it. Yet is the keyword. Yeah, yeah. Because 
actually the money thing does not affect us day to day and um you know as in our interaction about it and the fact that we are on the same page albeit the wrong page but it, it you know if we're both on the same wrong i'm okay with that but what it did highlight for me is how much i what's the word i guess i'm afraid of the judgment of when people say oh you don't share money and yet gary sees it completely different and his friends think it's a fucking marvelous idea you know, it's funny how two people can see something so differently i was and from a female perspective my friends are sort of like oh you don't share money well there's no trust and there's no you know taking care of each other whereas gary's mates were like fucking marvelous she lets you spend your own money this is brilliant do you know and it's funny that because from a female perspective it's like and it is i guess and i'm not like that because i have never been in a relationship like that where i've had I've never had a relationship where someone took care of me or, or or wooed me or bought me presents or was even particularly romantic in any way, shape or form. I don't, you know, I just don't sort of go there secretly. I think it would be lovely. It would probably irritate the fuck out of me. But, you know, there's a bit of me that would like someone to be like that. It's interesting, isn't it? Because women tend, we tend to think that loving someone is, a, you know, that you should give everything you have to them or that you should, you know, what's mine is yours and actually you know most successful marriages are where you're both on the same page whatever page it is right or wrong page that you both understand where you stand yeah and that's actually so that made me feel quite good it's like we have very clear-cut rules about money as i say i don't know what happens if that gets blown up or, I know if gary um, lost his job or could not work then of course this, I, I i would never pull that over on him no. you know i would never not share with him um but it as we are both functioning and able to work and both have money at the moment i'm okay with you know well there's a bit of me that thinks well he should just pay for me and then i think well actually why should he why yeah. should he would i for him would you for brad if brad just wanted to sit around and paint his toenails would you be happy to support him i have done that before was he painting his toenails? He's really paint around. He would end up doing freelance work. Um, yeah, but that's what I mean. He's not think, sitting around painting his toenails. I will say, you know, honestly, I probably made his life hell when he did that. I did because I managed the money. So I would constantly yeah. show him my fear. I would constantly show him my fear. Now he talks about not wanting to, to work. And if, you know, previous to today, it would scare the crap out of me. There's some things in conversations with him of late that I'm like, you know what? Maybe we just let it fly and see what happens. There, we I dabble in that. We'll see. We've got there's. What do you mean by let it fly? We just let it all go and wait. Let's let it go and let's just take off in our RV named Ned and see what happens. Screw it. I'd love to do that. I know. And if we didn't have the chickens, I would do that instantly. Yeah. There's no reason why, there's no really, there's no reason, soul wise, limitless wise, why we can't. There is illusion and all the other things wise as to why we can't. And that's the part that I'm like, okay, here's the interesting bits. These are the things we need to, that we just can. And because of this work that we've been doing, I am, and because of this work that we're doing and the work that I've done on myself, I have. I'm able to talk to him in a different way. And now he's able to respond to me in a way that I can hear. It's, it's interesting to watch how it's all happening to the point where he's reading Thich Nhat Hanh and other kinds and finding meditation. It's interesting. That's to the point, to the side. The thing for you, what they want me to bring you back with is just the right now is just the identification that you have with money. And how can we let it go. And it's just bit by bit. So this is a huge thing. Identification with money. It talks a lot about. Know, yeah. And so how I, I did a lot of work with Annie before about where my parents stood with regard to money. Um, ironically, my mother less so, although she was penny pinching, my mother um, assumed it was my father's role to, to make the money. And she was all right with that sort of thing. Let, maybe not latterly she was yeah there's a lot there but my dad certainly yeah I, yeah I've always come from a um 
scarcity mentality absolutely oh I my father never does yeah our whole culture does my, my father was self-employed in kenya and really didn't make very much money at all and actually i think my mother was a bit disparaging about it. she seemed quite much a fact about it she brought me up to believe that we were fucking um on the bread line i mean i realized now we weren't but we we never had things like we weren't allowed chocolate or apples all my friends had them my mom told me they didn't exist <laughs> can't buy the chocolate doesn't exist in kenya that's funny because all my friends have it <laughs> wow. but anyway yes yeah. there's a lot of i know there's a lot there and i know that for me it all revolves exactly about the freedom and feeling safe and that's probably i'm asking that's like that's like the good place to start is what i hear them say there'll be more it feels like after that <laughs> so but it's a good place to start it feels <laughs> that's releasing isn't it um it feels enormous but i actually do feel better about my decision about um just spending the money i have to that w in any way shape or form that will make me content with my everyday life because i'm not talking about lots of money it's just money i wouldn't spend right now until i was you know all that until i am and it's like there is no until yeah there's no that's that's my point sort of like i i could you know i'm not talking about i don't spend much money at all but i'm not doing stuff outside it's not really about money but then my ego would go well you shouldn't really be spending any money because you're not making any but whereas i i'm now of my we're, we're not talking masses amounts of money i think i should there's also this mentality that why would you spend money on the house if you're going to sell it I'm just like, I've decided we're not selling, we're staying. I've decided this is where I want to live. As long as I make that decision, then I need to make this, do the things to this house that I would love to do. I want a little lean-to greenhouse at the back that me and the chickens can be in. I want to get the gardens cleared so that I can start growing plants and flowers. And, and I know that, and that's going to be so good for me yep. to be outside playing in the dirt with the chickens. So much fun. Love it well thank you <laughs> for joining us for this week's episode of making lights two humans being and i would say we were very much being human in this episode uh money is a big deal as everybody probably knows it can trip us up in more ways than one so hopefully this helped some of you see what it means to be a human around money uh, if you have any questions or concerns or thoughts, please share them in the comments below or follow us on Facebook and Instagram, where you can also leave comments, subscribe, please share this with your friends, ask them to do the same, hit that little bell and you'll get notified when we have a new episode. Other words, I think that's it. I'm Julie here with me as always is Kate Fogo, and this is Making Light to Humans Being. See you next time. <laughs>